Systems, um, Scaling Agile to the Enterprise with HP Agile Manager. Uh, we've got Ty Davis and John Falk joining us. And uh, so if we move on to the first slide. So this event is brought to you by HP. Um, both uh, Ty and John Falk uh, are from HP. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the event. So a little bit about myself. So my name is Stephen Shabrantovich. Uh, I work for a company called Infuse, and uh, we're a HP Gold Certified Partner of HP. Uh, we have our own tool that utilizes HP, UFT, and ALM to do test automation called Use Mango. Uh, I've been in software testing for over 20 years now and in the past few years focusing very heavily on Agile. So this presentation is of keen interest to me. I'm also the Agile SIG lead uh, in the UK, and I'm looking to set up a uh, Agile SIG event within the next couple of months, ideally, uh, based in London. So for those of you that are UK and particularly London-based, please keep an eye out on the Vivit website, and. Uh, uh, hopefully there'll be an event coming up soon. So next slide, and uh, this is not about me, this is all about Ty and John. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce you to the guys. So Ty Davis is a HP Agile Manager, um, and sorry, he's a Product Marketing Manager uh, for HP Software. Uh, he's got a great experience in the technology trends, working with various strategy and product marketing roles across Agile and the application lifecycle management. Uh, currently, product manager for HP Agile Manager. Um, I'll ask them to both say hi in a moment. The second person, the person who will be doing uh, the majority of talking, I believe, and will give you an excellent demo later on, is John Fork. He's a solution architect. Um, he's been responsible for working with clients to help them with the adoption of enterprise agile methodologies and then training industry standard best practices. 20 year plus career in uh, corporate IT and specializes in application development. Uh, he's a senior director of a global teleconference company, or has been, I better uh, and uh, He's uh, managed continual evolution of IT systems. So basically, John's got a very strong technical background, as well as being you know, the solution architect for uh, Agile um, Manager. So, um, Ty and John, do you want to say hello, guys? How's it going? Thanks, Devon. This is John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ty. Uh, so, on to the next one. Uh, this is a live session and it is being recorded. Uh, all the recordings are available to Vivid members. Um, if you're not a Vivid member, I would encourage joining. Um, and additionally, today's slide deck and webinar will be made available usually within 24 to 48 hours after the uh, session ends and we will send you a link once posted. Uh, please ask questions as you go along, and uh, the way to ask questions will be to use the questions pane. So on to the next slide. John, if we can move to the next slide. That's great, thank you. So um, if you look on the um, webinar control panel, uh, there will be a um, pull-out area called questions and chat. Uh, please post your questions in there. At the end of the presentation, uh, we will uh, do a Q&A session and uh, we will go through some of the questions that have been posted. So please keep your questions coming in as you go along. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, I, uh, over to Ty. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, that introduction. 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ty Davis. I just want to talk to you a little bit about today's agenda. Uh, I'll be providing a high-level overview of the Agile Magic product. And then John will highlight the demo, which was broken into several segments. John will cover user story management and IDE integration, dashboard and reporting capabilities, then integration to AOM QC, and additional features within the Agile Manager solution with time at the end for questions. So the industry has seen this growing adoption of agile development methodology across large corporations and enterprises, but with mixed success. That's because agile, traditionally, doesn't scale very well, and HT looked at providing a solution for scaled enterprise agility. We knew there needed to be visibility and collaboration at a large scale. There needed to be a balance of velocity and quality, and this is critical as we've spoken to a lot of organizations that have said, hey, you know, I want to implement agile development because we want to release working code more quickly. Uh, we want to update our software more quickly. Uh, unfortunately, quality is uh, generally an afterthought. And if they don't have uh, that balance of velocity and quality, they're not going to have successful implementation of agile development. And third, we want to make sure they have a balance of complete life cycle agility, and uh, not just development efforts within agile, but project conception requirements planning, application development, uh, ultimately over to testing and production deployment. Okay, so we come to our first polling question. Um, are you currently using uh, an other HP software product? And please check all that apply. Um, so uh, John and Ty, um, I'm, I'm, this, this whole topic sounds terribly exciting around Agile and having a corporate-wide tool. I mean, how do you perceive the need for this tool? Hey, this is John. I'll jump in there. I, I think what we see a lot of organizations looking for is that tighter integration between the development organization and the quality testing organization ultimately moving to more of a DevOps solution. But they have to start implementing that in stages. And historically, we've seen a little bit of separation between the development organization and the quality teams, where a lot of time, especially in an agile environment, where the developers are developing code at even a more accelerated rate now, two-week sprints, and they're throwing working code over to the testing team more frequently. And we need to make sure that the testing team is working lockstep with the development organization to make sure they're able to maintain a high level of not only quality, but delivery of, of functioning code. And so this enterprise agility, not just scaling the development portion across the enterprise, but also integrating it with the testing organization, the development tools, the build tools themselves, to, to really look at it as a complete solution. I would concur with you on that one, John. That's certainly experience that I've been seeing here as well. So over to Ty, do you want to comment on the results? Yeah, it looks like uh, with the results, we have about 60, 67% ALM users, 43% quality center. And again, this may be uh, multiple users, it's not just one, um, about 30% PPM. 25% that use at HPE tools and about 11% at none. So it shows us good results on uh, we have a, a strong community of HP tool users here. What we can do is move on to the next slide. There we go. Uh, the reality is most large enterprises aren't homogeneous environments. They still have a lot of traditional waterfall development happening. Uh, they've just introduced Agile, and that naturally leads to a hybrid environment where they may have a large waterfall project, but one component like the GUI interface uh, that needs a faster refresh cycle is going to be done in an Agile methodology, so you have to be hybrid environment. Or the organization hasn't fully embraced Agile, and they're running a mix of waterfall and Agile and more of a water scrum fall methodology, coupled with multiple developer tools source code management platforms, build systems across many geographically distributed areas. Uh, in many instances, they have developers in North America, Europe, offshore to Southeast Asia, and frequently the quality or 
IT teams are in different locations than the development organization. In order to alleviate the strain of managing these distributed developer platforms, uh, by using Agile Manager in tandem with AOM, it provides that source of record, that single pane of glass to manage all requirements and defect information, as well as have visibility into the build and code system deployed throughout the organization. Agile management at its core is an agile project management tool. It manages releases, user stories, and it has defect management module. Uh, what really differentiates an enterprise class tool from a non-enterprise tool are the ALI integration. ALI is application lifecycle intelligence, and that provides visibility and synchronization to various IDE build systems and source code management platforms. And of course, we have the native synchronization to other HP tools, such as ALM and PPM. Some of the key characteristics of Agile Manager is that it's available as a SaaS-based or on-prem solution. The SaaS solution is hosted in the HP cloud and available as an instant on-service. The on-prem solution is attractive to organizations that have regulatory compliance issues or have a requirement to run an on-prem solution. The second part is key here. Agile Manager is developed with an Agile methodology itself. So we have a regular releases driven by user feedback. Basically, there's a, a monthly release for Agile Manager. It's kind of a, a more feature function, an enhancement loop. And every quarter, there's a major release. And a lot of the features and functionality you'll see in the demo is a direct result of uh, end user feedback. We have a very active customer base. And they are always giving us feedback about what enhancements they'd like to see in that tool. Many of those enhancements make it into our own product backlog, move up the list of the prioritization, and they're ultimately deployed in a product or a production release. Uh, you also see a modern, clean, intuitive user interface. Uh, you, we kind of wanted to make it a, like a smartphone app for once you install it, uh, you don't have to go through a huge learning curve and training to use the project. It's pretty intuitive and easy to use. Uh, obviously, it doesn't replace getting any sort of agile practitioner or agile practitioner certification or Scrum Master certification, but just using the tool. Uh, moving a user story or requirement through the tool helps guide the end user along with the best practices of Scrum or Kanban. Uh, lastly, the organization, the organization that are really looking to scale Agile across the enterprise, we are a SAFE certified global partner. Uh, SAFE is a scaled Agile framework, framework, and we can touch on that bit a, a little bit later. Agile Manager is broken into several distinct sections that really help simplify and quantify the, de the development process. So there's a distinct section for release planning, and then it moves on to sprint planning, and where you can do your team assignments, manage team velocity and capacity. There's a section for sprint execution, so we can deliver that code. And then something that we really think different, differentiates Agile Manager is a retrospect and close. We see a lot of organizations doing really well in the sprint planning and sprint execution, doing their daily stand-up meetings, but they don't do a really clean retrospective and close. When they don't close out a sprint completely, they tend to fall behind in the development cycle. So it's important from the entire life cycle, from the beginning of our product all the way to the retrospective and close to make sure that everything's wrapped up. The fourth step is really uh, available through the first three steps completely, and that's a high level of visibility and insight. We're able to do, deliver that visibility and insight without the developer or testing organization doing anything out of the ordinary. Both teams are doing their normal work and we're gathering those metrics on the back end and presenting those in a meaningful way that are actionable and the team can use to further enhance the software development. Through the entire process, we really look towards moving towards continuous testing and continuous deployment. So we want to automate and run regression testing 
not at the end of every sprint, but at the end of every build, so we can get information back to the development team as quickly as possible to identify defects and problems so they can be solved sooner rather than later. As Agile has evolved over time, it wasn't too long ago that the average sprint was four weeks. And after talking to a lot of organizations now, a four-week four scrum, I'm sorry, a four-week seems almost more like a waterfall project, so we see a lot of two-week sprints. So code is being delivered to QA and IT operations at an accelerated rate so frequently becoming the bottleneck. So it's important to do this uh, testing as quickly as possible and automate as much as possible to alleviate those bottlenecks, not only on the testing team, but ultimately IT operations for product deployment. We have a native synchronization between Agile Manager and AL Quality Center where we are synchronizing requirements, defects, test data, releases and metrics via ALM and QC. You have access to the whole suite of products that are part of the tool like unified functional testing to automate your testing. Key part is at the bottom here. Uh, using, uh, using ALM and QC in sync with Agile Manager gives your enterprise support for both Agile and non-Agile projects. That's the reality of a lot of enterprises. From a third-party integration perspective, uh, common IDEs like IntelliJ, Visual Studio, Eclipse, we have a source code management, Git, GitHub, SV, and TFS, uh, build systems like Hudson's, Jenkins, Electric Cloud, Unit Testing, Code Coverage. Uh, so all these integrations exist. Not only does HP develop and support them, uh, so you can see the, the solid blue lines there, uh, but we have 30, Bamboo, for example, are all third-party integrations that have been created for Agile Manager. Next, we'll go into the last polling question for John. Go ahead and uh, start a nice little demo for us. So we'd like to see if, uh, if you've heard of HP, Ma HP Agile Manager previously. A, yes, and currently an Agile Manager user. Uh, B, yes, but not currently an Agile Manager user. And C, no. Just watching the results here. It seems uh, there's about a large majority, around 60% uh, that uh, have heard of Agile Manager but are not currently using and uh, about 25% are current Agile Manager users, and around 21% are have not heard of Agile Manager and are not using that tool. So with that, I'm going to pass along to John here. He's going to go ahead and run these through a demo, and uh, we'll have questions at the end. Thanks, Ty, and thanks, everyone, for joining the uh, webinar. Uh, like Ty said earlier for the demonstration today, hang on, let me get my uh, screen sharing going. Uh, for the demonstration today, I'm going to kind of provide that high-level overview of Agile Manager, show you guys the interface, and then I'm really going to focus on that user story creation, user story management, along with the synchronization to ALM and Quality Center. And I think based on this group, I, I, this is a, an ideal presentation. It looked like we had a lot of ALM and Quality Center users out there or people familiar with it. And actually, I saw you know a good-sized group of people that are using PPM as well, and we have that native synchronization with PPM. Um, and, and then to show how those two tools really work together to, to form a, a seamless environment for managing not only your development efforts, but your quality and testing work as well. And then as time permits, I'll walk through as much of the interface as I can, showing additional features and functionality. And again, I'll make sure to uh, leave 10 or so minutes at the end so we have plenty of time for some questions and wrapping things up. So you should all be seeing my screen now, and this is... Uh, the Agile Manager interface, and we really tried to keep it simple and efficient to use. Uh, so Agile Manager itself is broken up into six distinct se sections, kind of like Ty was talking about. We have the dashboard, where all of our charts and graphs and metrics are displayed for the team to have visibility and insight into what's happening in their development efforts. We have a product backlog, where we manage our releases, and we do all of our release planning, uh, create our user stories, and determine what needs to be included in future releases. And then as we move left to right through the tool, we're going to move into release management. Uh, once work has been assigned to a release, 
This is where we'll get more granular and we'll manage our individual sprints, sprint assignments. We'll manage our team's velocity, our team's capacity, and ultimately uh, the tasks that we're working on in the task board or the storyboard. Uh, and then we have a separate section for defect management. Uh, defect management integrates down to the IDEs. Uh, defects can be created in the IDE through unit. Backlog perspective in the hierarchy supports three layers of hierarchy. We have themes or epics, which are at the parent level. We have features, and then we have backlog items. Uh, over here on the right-hand side, we have our various releases that are available for uh, this project. And then we have our grid or our section where we show all the detailed information, either the, the detailed themes, features, or backlog items. Uh, for today's demonstration, just to put some context around things, I'm going to use the concept of an HP media store. It's kind of like Amazon.com, an online store where we can purchase movies, books, and music. Uh, and then we also support multiple applications within Agile Manager, so you can have multiple development efforts happening simultaneously, and depending on what have you have access to see, uh, you select the application that you want to view, or all of them in this case. So again, a lot of granularity, a lot of capability to support enterprise production. So at this epic or theme level for my media store, I have a movie store, a book store, a billing store, self-provisioning. And then as I drill in the next layer down in the hierarchy, I have the features that are members of those themes. Uh, credit card purchasing, audiobooks, music purchasing, book searching, for example. Uh, this is where we touch on some of the safe compatibility where we do a weighted shortest job first score, cost of delay, so we can use uh, uh, safe methodologies for determining the prioritization of delivering work. And then we have the backlog. This is where all of our user stories are uh, created, and this is where they're maintained and ultimately used to planning to go into a release. So uh, again, we try to keep the interface very simple, very easy to use, and a, and a simple flow for managing our project. I'm going to go ahead and start by creating a new item. And I'm going to create a new user story. And I'm going to use a template. You don't have to, but I can say, uh, based on using a template, it's automatically going to create some generic tasks and uh, 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 test cases for me, uh, test criteria uh, for this user story. So uh, although I could go create those manually, it's easiest to use a template. Uh, you'll notice. Only two fields have asterisks to buy them. So we have type and name have to be filled in. So Agile Manager also scales down very well for small projects or introductory projects, where I could just create a user story, give it a name, assign it to a release, and get going with my development. So again, scales down, support smaller projects. But from an enterprise perspective, and where we have a more complex project like our media store, where I had themes, features, and a lot of backlog items, we want to be able to support a more complex hierarchy. I'm going to take my new user as a user. I'll call it the Vivid, Vivid Webinar. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and assign it to a, one of my themes at the parent level. So I, I'll select the bookstore. And then under the bookstore, which is my theme or epic, I see all my available features. And I'll go ahead and assign this to the book purchase. Uh, I can assign it a priority. And then I could, if I knew the release and team I wanted to assign it to now, I could do that. But I'll save that for a little bit later. And then I can assign some story points. And I'm sure most organizations that are agile already have a methodology for assigning story points. Uh, the one thing to note here is that uh, themes, features, and backlog items are always measured in story points or levels of complexity. When we get into tasks, we measure those in hours because it's actual work that developers are doing. So story points for the, for the user stories and the core work and tasks are done in hours. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And it's going to add this new user story to the bottom of my product backlog. And when I scroll down there, we should see my new user as a user, Vivid Webinar. And again, we wanted to create a drag and drop interface to manage this. So uh, to go ahead and assign this to a release, I'm going to assign it to my Media Store 2.0 release. I just simply pick it up and drop it on the release. 
and it'll now assign it to the media store and update all the velocity and the capability of our media store. Uh, and again, I can always drill in at our, at our media store on any of the links. I can see how many teams are assigned uh, to work in the media store. I can see the expected velocity for Sprint. So just by clicking, I can help manage that, that uh, release and to make sure that the assignments are doing fit within the, the scope that I've set for that release. But I'm going to show you now at this early stage, even though we've only just created user story, how we already give that visibility over to the quality team. So I'm going to switch screens over here to ALM. And that should be coming up now. And in the ALM interface, I see that same hierarchy, because I've synchronized everything over from uh, Agile Manager. I see my music store, my movie store, my book store. I see the features, album database, for example. And in this case, I see all the user stories that are part of that feature and what the current status is from an ALM perspective. So those of you who are familiar with ALM have seen direct cover status before, whether it's passed, whether it's failed, whether it still needs to be covered. I see the user story status coming in from uh, Agile Manager. Uh, so if it's done, if it's in testing, the prioritization and what cycle it's going to be part of. I've added this one to our bookstore and it won't be here yet So because I haven't synchronized. So here, you see these in a different state of progress. Visibility into what's coming at them, even though development hasn't started working on it yet. So in many cases, they've just created a new requirement, assigned it to a release, but they haven't started working on it yet. It's new. After development picks it up and starts working on it, it moves to an in-progress status. And that lets the quality team know that this is going to be imminent. Within this next sprint, Sprint 9, development is going to be finishing this work, and they're going to have to test this. So they can start planning their resources. Uh, we have a synchronization tool that's included at no additional charge with Agile Manager or ALM to synchronize between uh, Agile Manager and ALM. Uh, this is a small application that runs on an automated basis. It can be set to run as near time as every five minutes. Um, there's a new version of this that just released that's integrated into Agile Manager. It just released last weekend, so I haven't had a chance to set that up and configure it. But basically, it works the same, where we have this small application or this small environment that just keeps synchronization between the, the platforms. And so now that I've run synchronization, and again, I'm just forcing synchronization uh, for just the scope of going through this, this webinar. But normally, that would be done on an automated process. And I'm sure the text probably is a little small, so hopefully you guys are looking at this in 100% or 110% in this view. I can't change the text. But we see our new user story we added uh, as a user visit webinar. Uh, it's obviously not covered. Testing hasn't been done yet. Uh, it's new, and I've assigned it to that release. So even in this early stage, the quality team gets visibility that a new requirement has been created. It has a priority. And it's, it's in this part of the flow of the, of the uh, project that's being worked on. So beyond just the themes, features, and user stories that we synchronize over, uh, within ALM, we also synchronize over all the release information. So I can go to the release screen. And I can see my media store release, my media store 2.1 release. I can see all the cycles or sprints. And I can see the dates that all those sprints are needing to be completed at. Again, just keeping that visibility over to the quality team so they understand what the developers are working on, what their time frames are, and what they need to test to make sure that testing is staying in sync with what development is developing. And then, of course, we have our defect management as well within ALM. So frequently, uh, after testing is done, if a defect needs to be created, uh, we would go ahead and create this new defect. So we'll call it a, just a vivid defect. And I'll assign it a severity. Submit it. Now I've created that new defect. Uh, this synchronization is bi-directional. So uh, if I create anything in Agile Manager, it's going to synchronize down to ALM. If I create anything in ALM, like this defect, it's going to synchronize back up to Agile Manager. Again, so we keep that visibility between both platforms. And we're able to maintain that system of record that Ty was talking about. So I'm going to go back up here to the requirements. 
And I'm going to leave this in new. I'm going to show you how this changes as we progress this user story through the process in Agile Manager and development starts picking it up and working on it. I'm going to jump back over here to Agile Manager. And I have my uh, Vivid, Vivid webinar. I've assigned it to the release. And now again, moving left to right, I'm going to go to my release management tab. And now I see more detail. I'm looking at the Media Store 2.0 release specifically. And I see all the available sprints for this release. Sprint 9 is the current release. I see the teams and their available velocity that they can work on. And again, just like I did at the release level, I can drill and look at an individual team, see what their expected velocity is per sprint, and see how well they're delivering on their velocity. So I see their expected velocity of 50 story points. And at a glance, I can see whether or not they're delivering at that velocity. Obviously, this team is falling short every time. Again, it really helps me determine if I need to do uh, better sprint planning, am I overestimating uh, my story points, uh, or is the team just not delivering at the velocity that's expected. So at a glance, it really helps the team manage themselves to make sure that they're able to deliver all the information needed within a sprint. But I'm going to go ahead and scroll down. And add it to the bottom here, I see my, uh, as a user, Vivid webinar. And I'll go ahead and assign it to a team, and I'll just pick the blue team. And again, with that drag and drop interface, I change this assignment over to the blue team. And it's going to go ahead and update this to the blue team and their available capacity. I did that in Sprint 9. I'll move over to the Sprint backlog. And here's where I see the detail now within that Sprint. I'm building that grand. The blue team specifically. And here I see my uh, new user story that I created. And I see all the tasks, uh, review the requirements, write the code, and run the unit tests that need to be done to deliver this story. Uh, in, the, in the Sprint backlog, I can see I have user stories and a couple of defects that need to be worked on. And so these icons uh, let you know whether it's a user story, it has a little user icon on it. If it's a defect, it has the broken page icon. So I can see whether we're working on defects or user stories within this Sprint. But a defect is almost the same as a user story. It's just a development requirement that needs to be done within a sprint. And here's where I see all of my team members and their available capacity. And again, just like I looked at from the release at a high level or at the uh, team at a high level, here I can look at the individual users or developers. And here's where they can manage their availability. And so I can see what sprints are available for, how many days of work they have, hours per day. Again, if a developer is going to be gone for a day, uh, he can take his I'm going to be on vacation. I'm going to drop this down to five hours of work that I'm available. This is where you can really manage uh, not only the velocity that the team is delivering, but what their availability is. So again, very simple uh, for their team to keep everything updated. And here's where I can assign work to the team members. So uh, I'll go ahead and grab this and assign it off to give him ownership of the user story. And he, by default, gains ownership of all of the individual requirements. But I can go ahead and take the the tasks, and I can go reassign those to uh, other developers if I want to. So uh, just by editing the details on the task, I can pull it up and say, uh, instead of Tom doing this task, I'm going to go ahead and take this task and assign it to Michael Parker, and I'm going to update that. So the entire team can even work on individual tasks that are broken up within a user story. So I've gone through the release backlog, went into the sprint backlog, and now I'm going to jump over to the task board. And this is where developers We have that simulated whiteboard uh, with the virtual post-it notes that you can drag and drop, and the team can track their time. Uh, so uh, we have these little time clocks, uh, bubbles, if you will, or stopwatches. So if uh, Michael spent some hours on this task, he can select the clock, uh, reduce two hours on it. So before the daily stand-up meeting, he can keep the team up to date on what his deliverables are. And we can see the status of these, whether they're in testing or in progress. I'm going to go ahead and move this down to our new user story I created as a user of the Vivid webinar. Uh, we assign these three tasks, review the design requirements, uh, write the code, and then run the unit testing. And so the developer, when he starts working on it, will drag it to in progress. And as he, it's going to change the, uh, the status from new to in progress. And he's going to start uh, reducing his hours of time. And then it updates his metrics or his uh, visibility into what's happening 
uh, from his story perspective. And then when he drags it over to complete, uh, it, it retires all that time. And again, he can start just working on this effort. And he can do things in parallel. So he can be writing code and running unit tests uh, and just keeping that updated to in progress. But the point here is I'm going to go back to ALM and again, show how this continues to update the testing team on the progress that development is making. So I'll do a quick uh, incremental synchronization. Again, this would normally run on an audit process. I'd set it to run every five minutes or so. That would uh, update this information. But for the webinar, I don't want to wait. And I'm going to refresh. And go back down to my bookstore. And here I see the Vivid webinar has moved to an in-progress status. So now the quality team sees that development is actually working on this. It's been uh, now assigned to a sprint. It's in sprint nine, the current sprint, and it's in progress. I will go back to Agile Manager, and I'm going to finish this work in this case. So I'll say, hey, I, I've completed writing the code, and I've run all of the unit tests. And when I set the last task to completed, not done, because it's all determining that definition of done in Agile, um, I'm going to change the status. I can move it from, uh, I can leave it from in testing. And this is going to tell the quality team that development has finished their work and they need to run testing on it. I'll go ahead and save this. It moves this from uh, in progress to in testing. And again, I'm going to jump back to ALM. It should take just a second. Fresh. And now when I go look at that new requirement, I see it's in testing. And now this is the indicator that development has finished their work. They've completed all of the tasks. And it's up to quality to do the testing on it. Now what quality would normally do is they would right click on this. If you're familiar with uh, ALM, it looks like a lot of you are. And they would say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and convert this to a test, and I'm going to move it into the test lab and run all my sprinter or UFT tests or whatever testing I need to do. Uh, in this case, I'm going to cheat. I'm not going to uh, spend the time doing the testing on it. So I'm just going to change direct cover status to past. And I'm going to set the story status to done. So I'm going to say, hey, quality has tested this. It's passed. Because development has, has completed their work, the ball's in quality's court now to do the testing on it. And the developers are moved on to the next thing that they're working on. And they're just waiting to see what the results of testing are. So they're going to set direct cover status to past and set this to done. And again, because we have that bi-directional synchronization, uh, up until now, all this data has been coming down from Agile Manager over to ALM and Quality Center. This is the case now where uh, the quality team has updated the user story, and we're sending that status back up to Agile Manager. And so we're going to go back to Agile Manager here one last time, and we'll look in the uh, product backlog and we'll see what this has been updated to. And when I go look at this story now, I see direct cover status is set to past, and the story is done. So at this point, the developer is like, hey, everything's good to go. Uh, quality has tested it. I've just been waiting to see what the result was. And now this is off my list. This is done, and this is ready to go in production uh, with the sprint and, and with this release, ultimately. Uh, what should be noted here is this direct cover status. You see it's kind of a light gray. This is not a settable field within Agile Manager. The only way direct cover status can be set is via synchronization up from ALM or Quality Center. So the developer cannot take direct cover status and set it to pass. It's not configurable. So moving this story status to done and getting this direct cover status is something that should come up from ALM or Quality Center. The other thing I want to show here, I'm kind of keeping an eye on the time, is I want to show that full traceability. What happens when that story failed testing and the quality team creates a defect. So I'm going to jump over to the defect uh, management module. And here I see all of the defects uh, that we have listed. And I see linked items. So let's say I, am, I, I sent a story over. It came back as failed. And I see a link on it. I see this link chain. I know that the quality team has created an associated defect. And then it's up to the Agile 
team to determine uh, the severity of that defect and when it needs to be worked on. It might need to be fixed in this existing in the current sprint if it's a showstopper, or maybe it's something simple like the position of a label on a GUI interface, and they say, hey, you know, this is something we'll just work on in the future. Let's move it to the product backlog, and we'll fix this when we have time, when maybe we're doing a defect sprint or something. So now some months will buy potentially. you know, what user story was being worked on or tested uh, when this defect was introduced. And because it has a linked item, uh, he can drill into the detail on this defect, and he can follow uh, the, the link back to the user story that it's linked to. And when he clicks on the user story, uh, he can see who originally worked on it, and he can go look at the development activity on that user story. And he can say, oh, Alex worked on this user story back in January 16th, and here's a source code repository that he had checked out and modified uh, when this defect was introduced. So if Alex is still with the organization, uh, Ty could go talk to Alex and say, hey, I'm working on this defect uh, that, that you introduced with your requirements or your user story. Or maybe Alex has left the organization. At least he has that full traceability uh, back to see you know, what source code repositories to look at uh, to start working on this defect. And these are all metadata links, so if this was live information, uh, Ty would actually be able to click on this and open up the, that source code or do a dot .diff on it and uh, really dig into uh, getting this defect resolved. So this is just a case that shows that, that full integration uh, between the IDE where we can synchronize tasks and requirements down to the IDE, check out the code, uh, check in the code, and it automatically updates the Agile Manager with the development activity, and then that defect can be linked back to the requirement and it's easy to see with the, with the defect icon. So if I'm in the product backlog, for example, um, again, I can see that that's linked to the defect. I can see the linked items. Uh, so it gives that ability to really work and bring uh, not only development and quality together, but bring that full traceability back to the development environments and to the uh, source code repository environments as well. As, so you get that, again, single interface, that single pane of glass to completely manage the project. And so I know that was a lot of information there, so there may be some questions on that at the end. But that's an example of that full traceability. So I'm going to jump back to the uh, release management, uh, back to my storyboard. A couple of things I want to show you here, and something that Ty had talked about is uh, that sprint closure. So uh, after the sprint is done, we've finished all this work, and we're doing our sprint retrospective and close. Uh, I'm going to drop back here to sprint two that I want to look at. And here in the retrospective and close, I get a wealth of information. So I see how many stories I've completed, how many defects I've worked on, uh, did we have any new defects detected uh, during the sprint, how many build breaks did we have, uh, how much of this information was planned ahead of time or how much was added during the sprint. Hopefully if sprint planning is going well, most of this information, most of the stuff we're working on is pre-planned. Uh, sometimes you have showstoppers or things that, that need to be done in a sprint uh, during the sprint cycle. So we have that in the added section. Uh, we can see from a cumulative flow diagram how much of the work did we complete, uh, acceptance tests passed and failed, uh, just to make sure we're getting everything done. We have some common sections where we can put what went well and things we need to improve on. And then we have this section for non-development action items, uh, just to make sure, again, as the sprint wraps up that everything's getting done. So maybe we need to set an environment meeting uh, with some of the team members. Uh, we might need to talk to IT operations because we need some additional server resources for this, this new release that's coming out. And the team can go through and make sure that everything is closed up at the end of the sprint. But you notice when we did this uh, sprint, we only finished three of the four user stories or, or four of the six defects. So what do we do with these open items? Again, we don't want anything lingering at the end of the sprint. So we have this little slider bar that says we have three open items. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And I can see that I have this user story that's not complete. Uh, I can click on it and decide what do I want to do with it. I get a couple of options. I could just roll it to the next sprint and work on it in sprint three, for example. Uh, maybe the product owner and the team determined it wasn't that important anyway. So we could just move it back to the planning board or back to the product backlog. And we'll work on it in the future. Or what's most common is we can split this story. So let's say it was a big story. It had 12 hours worth of tasks. 
and we finished 10 of them. We just didn't get the last two hours worth of work done or the last couple of tasks done. Well, I can split the story and I can leave the, the, the completed work in sprint two and only move the remaining work that needs to be done to sprint three. So let's give credit where credit's due to the work that's done in sprint two. And if we want, we can just move the remaining effort to sprint three as a split story. So in sprint three, there's only going to be three hours of, or two hours of additional work or whatever's left on that story. So it gives us an opportunity to really close out that story really well and make sure we have a good close of that sprint. And then at the end of that sprint retrospective and close, I like to take a few minutes and look at this ALI summary and kind of see how we're on target for the release. I have still quite a few uh, months left before this release is complete. But I get visibility in how I'm doing from a velocity perspective. Uh, I can see side-by-side -side comparisons in sprint three. I was delivering 100 story points, dropped to 92 story points in sprint four, in sprint five, down to 83 story points. So again, something the team can look at themselves and say, hey, why are we losing velocity? Again, are we not doing a good sprint planning here? Are we not doing good estimating on our story points? Have we had people out on vacation? You know, why aren't we delivering at that higher rate we were back on sprint three? And is this going to impact the ultimate end date of that release? So a lot of visibility, again, like Ty said, of people just doing their normal work and, and being able to understand what's happening, uh, not only from a, a user story requirements perspective, but up to the sprint and ultimately a release perspective. So a lot of metrics that are just available. And I have just a few minutes left. I did want to show you uh, two more sections quickly. Uh, the build section, uh, we have integration into the build systems like Ty talked about. Uh, so I can see uh, from this interface whether the nightly builds have succeeded, whether they failed, how many lines of code were delivered on that build. And then I can scroll down and I can drill into the build detail. So I can select a build, for example, let's say failed or, or let's say there was some anomaly there. We had a, a, some test coverage issues. Uh, and I can go look at all the user stories delivered within that build. And again, because I have that link to that user story, I can say, hey, these user stories were included in this build. I can click on this user story and I always drill into the detail and look at the development activity uh, for that individual story as part of a build. So visibility not only from a sprint perspective, but from a build perspective as well. And then I can just uh, go back up to the build summary. And the last thing I want to show before I wrap things up is that dashboard. So metrics and reporting is really important when we're scaling Agile across the enterprise. It's important to have good visibility into what's happening in your environment. So the dashboard is fully uh, configurable and customizable. And here's where you would have all of your release burn down charts, your planning. Uh, in this case, I have a feature planned uh, versus actual story points, group velocity charts. Uh, this velocity is increased because I added a team member because we were falling behind, for example. Uh, here's my sprint burn down chart, uh, flow diagrams, uh, direct cover status, which is important, especially for the ALM user, so we can see uh, whether direct cover status is, is not covered, whether it failed or passed. Uh, all of these widgets are customizable. Uh, we have a add widgets section. And so we just have dozens and dozens of pre-built widgets that can be added to the dashboard so you can look at the information that's important to you. And we also have a widget wizard. So if you want to create a custom graph or chart because there's some data elements that you don't see a graph for, or you've created some user-defined fields or custom fields, you can create your own charts to capture that information and display it the way you want it. And you can take any of these dashboards and you can save it as a public dashboard. So if you create a cool dashboard or one dashboard you want the entire team to see, you can make it public so everybody's looking at the same dashboard, or you can make it private if it's just a dashboard that you want to see. Let's say you're a, a product owner and you want to watch this particular developer to see how he's doing delivering on his user stories. You could create a private dashboard where, where you're watching the developers and you may not want them to know, for example. And then again, all the dashboard elements. Uh, from an enterprise perspective, if you're sharing this on a WebEx or a webinar like we are, and I want to make sure everybody's looking at the same graph or chart. I'm talking about a, a graph or a chart, and there's a bunch of them on the screen. I can say I want to take this graph, and I want to make it full screen. That way we're all looking at this, this planning chart to see how well I'm doing on my estimating. And uh, obviously it doesn't look like I'm doing very well on this, uh, on this top one. I estimated 30 story points. It looks like it's going to take me uh, over 150 to deliver it, for example. Uh, so again, I can make sure we're all focused and looking at the same chart by simply uh, expanding it up to the to the full screen, and I can change the layout of the dashboard as well. So I can change how many columns I want to look at depending on how I want to view my information. So a lot of flexibility in the dashboard and reporting, 
all of these metrics are automatically generated from the quality team doing their work in ALM and the development team doing their work in Agile Manager. So uh, there's a lot more functionality here, uh, a lot of screens I didn't get to show you. Again, we had a, a pretty tight time frame here, so I, I apologize for that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I think I hit on most of the highlights, especially since we had such a broad audience for uh, ALM. And for the PPM people as well, we have that full integration into PPM and bringing all that time tracking and uh, project update into PPM. And all, a lot of these charts and graphs also synchronize up to PPM uh, for the PPM folks. But I'm going to go ahead and go to the closing slide and turn it back over to Ty and Stefan for questions. Brilliant, John. Thank you ever so much for that. That looks really impressive. One request to the audience, um, please continue to ask questions. We have a number of questions um, that uh, I'll pose to uh, John and Ty and for them to answer. But if you think of anything else as we're going along, uh, please, uh, please ask and we'll have a look. Uh, the second one is just as a reminder that um, please wait to the end of this presentation as we've got some uh, exciting news about HP Discover. Um, and a final reminder, uh, we've had a couple of questions asked if the slides will be available. Yes, they will be. There will be uh, an email sent out in about uh, one to two days uh, with a link to this uh, webinar. Okay, so John and Ty, uh, let's start with uh, the first question. Let's start with a sort of configuration setup issue, a question uh, from Paul. What is the lowest version of ALM that is compatible to integrate with uh, Agile Manager? 11. 11.x. Okay. Simple as that. Yeah. Simple as that, 11.x and forward. Perfect. Okay, um, so the second one, let's, let's do with the sort of in, an install type question. So what is the platform for on-premise installation from uh, Levi? Yeah, so the, the on-prem runs on a Linux Oracle environment. So it requires uh, two Linux servers. They can be virtual machines, VMs are fine, and then or Oracle 11G or higher for the database. Excellent. Okay, and uh, clearly there's further support needed if people need uh, more details on that. Absolutely. So we have documentation on full on-prem installation guides, configurations, but the foundation of it is, is Linux and Oracle. Perfect. Thank you very much, John. Okay, so let's, um, in no particular order now. Um, so. Uh, does all of the scheduled effort slash duration and actual time integrate into PPM work plan, staffing profile, and timesheets for on Stephen? Yes, it does. So in both cases, so all the user story invested time synchronizes over, and then the timesheets also synchronize over. Uh, the developer can log into PPM and say, I want to import my timesheet, and it'll bring his time uh, from Agile Manager and updated into PPM. That sounds very useful, actually, from a pro project program management perspective as well. We wanted to keep that simple. Developers generally dislike having to go into PPM and log all their time. And they're like, I already did all this logging of my time in Agile Manager by updating my tasks. So we take that information that the developers already did, keeping their tasks up to date, and we just import that right to their PPM timesheet. And I think, uh, I, I think there was a Vivid webinar on that uh, a month or so ago, so you could probably go uh, look at the replay of that webinar that, uh, that Ty actually had hosted, and I think they demoed part of that. So. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so uh, next question then, how are the done hours calculated in the planning? Uh, there's a sub uh, point on the members widgets used on the Sprint backlog page. Uh, say that again. How are the done right, hours so the, calculated? Yeah, how are done hours calculated that the planning members widgets use on the Sprint backlog page from so Charles? The, so I would say that 
the, if I'm answering this correctly, the done hours are the combination of all the task hours to complete the user story. So if I have a user story and it had four tasks, and each of those tasks was five hours, there would be a, a total of 20 hours of time. If I retire all of those tasks, and I, and I do it on time, I do each of them in five hours, the done hours are going to be cumulative of that 20 hours of effort. If it took me longer, let's say we did that task estimate of each of five hours, and it took us six hours to do each of those tasks, well, the done hours are now going to be uh, 24 hours, and you have a chart that shows we estimated 24 hours, but the actual was 24 uh, to complete all that work and to put it into a done status. And uh, again, that's available dashboard elements. So you can look at those uh, estimated hours and then actual hours, see what that difference is. But it's, it's accumulation of all the tasks being completed to generate the amount of hours to done of the, um, of the story. Again, only development effort, though. That would not count any time it took uh, for quality to work on it. That would be separate time tracking in ALS. OK, thank you for that. OK, so the, the last question I've got at the moment is, uh, when you drag a ticket to the media store, are members of the team notified? Uh, there's a sub-question, is the ticket assigned uh, a priority, or is, done, or is that done later? From Mary. So a couple of things on that. So it can be assigned yes. a priority. It doesn't need to be. Again, that's a choice depending on how you want to work the workflow. The workflow is customizable from that perspective. So you can assign it a priority of high, medium, and low. And you can actually prioritize it in the backlog overall and set how you want to deliver that work. Uh, when it is assigned to just the media store or a release, there will be no notifications sent I'm not sure who you would send the notification to on, on the release. For it to move from the backlog to a release planning, uh, that's something that the team is probably doing along with the product owner when they're doing their release planning. And even when it's moved into a sprint, that would be part of that sprint planning, and the entire Scrum team should be involved in that sprint planning progress. Where we do send notification is when a story is assigned to a team member or a task is assigned to a team member. So we can send an email notification that uh, a task has been assigned to you, or you've assigned yourself a task, so you can manage that work. So there are a lot of notifications, but generally down at the team member level, when something happens to a team member, we would send out a notification. Okay. That's great. I, I appreciate now we're at the top of the hour, so. Um, we, we may start losing uh, one or two people. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, cover um, two more slides whilst I've got people's attention. And then, um, I, I don't know, time, John, are you free for another five minutes later if there's any other questions that need asking? Absolutely. Perfect. OK, so uh, let's just move, as I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, HP Discover in Las Vegas uh, this year. Uh, it's June the 2nd to the 4th uh, at the Venetian uh, Resort at Las Vegas. Um, all members can register now via the uh, specific URL. Uh, if you use that, you will get some money off, so that's a really useful uh, feature there. So please, please, I can I encourage people to do it? Um, HP Discover is an amazing event, and I would thoroughly encourage people to attend it. Uh, another special aspect is that uh, Vivid is pleased to offer deep dive sessions. Uh, these sessions will allow you to hear real-world implementation experiences exa and examples from practitioners uh, who are in the field of solving business uh, problems with HP software tools. So real-life examples here from people delivering it. Uh, so these sessions will be held the day before HP Discovers on Monday the 1st of June from 1 p.m. to 5. Uh, more information can be found on Divit. Um, and uh, can I just encourage everybody to have a look? And then on, finally on to the um, last slide. Uh, just reminds me to uh, thank you all for this. Um, 
please can you uh, encourage everybody to complete the short survey um, and uh, and to opt in for more information from HP software. Uh, the survey is very useful for us, both Vivi and HP, uh, for all of us to learn about how we can do things, how things can be made better, and um, get some genuine feedback from yourself. So uh, can I encourage everybody to do that? So that concludes the core part of the webinar. John and Ty, thank you very much. I don't know if thanks, you got John, and thanks, Ty, and, and thanks, Vivit, for hosting this webinar for us. And I hope uh, all the participants uh, found it uh, informative. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with us. Yes, thank you. Be sure to download the free trial. Perfect. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>